Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to another webinar in our Lunch and Learn series. My name is Karen Caprice, and I'm honored to serve as Secretary Treasurer for the Alberta Federation of Labour, and I'm excited to be the host of this session. And thank you for taking your time to spend your lunch hour with us. I'm going to take a moment to begin with our land acknowledgement. And the Alberta Federation of Labour respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory in central Alberta, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, or Nakota, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community here in Edmonton and central Alberta. Treaty 7 territory in southern Alberta, a traditional territory of the Blackfoot Nation, Sisitka, Pekani, Kainai, and the Tutsina and Stony Nakota First Nations, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, as well as the Métis Nations of Alberta Region 3 in the Calgary and Southern Alberta area. And Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta, a traditional meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples, this territory provided a traveling route and home for the Cree, Dene, Inuit, as well as the Métis and many others in Northern Alberta. We recognize the history of oppression of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all other Indigenous people in their traditional land across Canada, and we are committed to doing the ongoing and active work of reconciliation. The Alberta Federation of Labour also recognizes that we are all treaty people with treaty obligations and are committed to living in accordance with the spirit of peace and friendship that is foundational to the treaty relationship. As a labour movement, we will actively work together in solidarity to end oppression and seek justice for all peoples of this land. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, today's session is going to focus on a very important topic called the importance of opposing privatization. As we know, the march towards privatization is an ever-present threat and ideological mandate of conservative governments. We are seeing the evidence of this not only here in Alberta under Premier Smith, but also in Saskatchewan and Ontario. The desire of conservative governments to, publish or to privatize public service is not new, nor is it limited to the guise of fixing the crisis in healthcare. In the not so distant past, Former Premier Ralph Klein eliminated tens of thousands of public sector jobs and rolled back wages and benefits to those who were laid off. Consider these statistics. In his 1994 budget, Klein cut 20% of the health care spending, 21% of the post-secondary education, and 12.4% of the K-12 education. The results were catastrophic. Homelessness climbed to 740%. 1,500 hospital beds were closed and 5,000 nursing positions were eliminated. Alberta's registries and liquor stores were also sold off and public assets were sold at far below market value. The cost of these services rose dramatically in this profit-driven environment. And one example of the increased cost is vehicle registration, which rose from $35 to $85. Privatization also caused a loss of revenue to the province. Consider the example of money generated by issuing driver's licenses. Once public, now private. And of course, the obsession to privatize services did not stop with the Klein government. Former Premier Ed Stelmack delisted some healthcare services, and the Health Resources Centre continued to perform orthopedic surgeries in private facilities, which started under the Klein government. Former Premier Allison Redford continued the practice of contracting out surgical and diagnostic procedures to for profit companies and former Premier Jason Kenney contracted out services that resulted in the loss of almost 7,500 unionized public sector jobs. Again, more private, for-profit care was proliferating in our province in the form of orthopedic, gynecological, urological, and general surgeries. Legislation was enacted to allow the government to contract directly with corporations that provided publicly funded services paid for with public money in private for-profit facilities. And now here we have Premier Danielle Smith, who has reached an agreement with Alberta Health Services and Alberta Precision Labs for DynaLife Medica Labs to deliver community lab services across, camp, uh, uh, excuse me, across Alberta. To quote Chris Galloway, Executive Director of Friends of Medicare, once again, this government is making it clear that they are more concerned with private, with private profits than they are with protecting and strengthening our existing public health care system to ensure that everyone has timely, quality access to the health care that they need. Privatization of health care, education, transit, registries, utilities, this all feels familiar and frightening. 
privatization has not delivered on the promises of efficiency or access to services, and Albertans have been on the hook to pay for failed privatization schemes. Today, we're very pleased to have two strong advocates and defenders of publicly funded and publicly delivered services. And I have the pleasure of first introducing Rebecca Graf McRae. Rebecca is a research manager for the Parkland Institute at the Alberta, or University of Alberta. And her areas of research include public health care, seniors care, and public services. She holds a PhD in politics from Queen's University, Belfast, and has previously held fellowships with the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's, Memorial University, Newfoundland, and University College Cork. Rebecca authored many publications and reports. Most recently, she's authored a report titled Misdiagnosis, Privatization and Disruption in Alberta, Alberta's Medical Laboratory Services. And we're also thrilled to have Mike Parker to join us. Mike has been a first responder since 1992, volunteering in his local community of Coaldale and graduated as a paramedic in 1999. He's been involved in the labor movement for many years, and since 2016, Mike has served as president for HSAA. Mike has always been a strong proponent of the role for unions in protecting the rights of citizens of the public sector and providing vital services. So thanks again for Mike and Rebecca for your time and sharing your expertise. Our presenters will be sharing information about the common myths about privatization, what actually happens when public services are defunded and the for-profit model is adopted, and the risk to the end users and workers. And friends, that's you and me and our family and friends. After the main presentation, I will ask a few follow-up questions and I'll be sure to leave times uh, for you folks who are turning in to ask questions as well. And to do so, please just simply type your questions in the question and answer function and we'll get to them as uh, to as many of them as we can. So I think we'll... Time to kick off the presentations, please. That's good. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us on your lunch hour. I'm just going to pull up my screen share here for a second. Okay. So it's always fun to see if your slides will advance as you go. <laughs> um, so uh, this time last year, uh, Parkland Institute produced a report on the uh, transition such a neutral term, the transition of some community laboratory services from um, the umbrella of Alberta Health Services and Alberta Precision Labs uh, to DynaLife as a private corporation. So the report, as Karen mentioned, is called Misdiagnosis. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the findings from that report. We did a deep dive into um, some documents that we obtained through freedom of information around that proposal process. How exactly um, was it determined that these services need, needed to be privatized? Um, and how was DynaLife awarded that process? Um, and I'll talk you guys through a little bit about uh, some of the background to that, because this is not the first time we have been on this merry-go-round for lab services in Alberta. Uh, from there, I'm going to talk a little bit. Talking that issues around privatization. My question always as a researcher and as an advocate for public services is to ask what's at stake. It's very easy um, to hear a narrative, particularly from government spokespeople, that this is about saving money, this is about efficiency, this is about providing seamless services for everyone at a bargain discount rate, whatever it is. There's always an official narrative. But um, it's important to ask questions about what's not being said and what's not being shared in that narrative. So for us, the first question is to say, who benefits from this absolutely um, disruptive shift in laboratory service to the delivery? And what lessons can Alberta's past experience 
uh, and other places across Canada or, or other jurisdictions um, who have privatized their lab services, what does that offer to this debate? We have a long history of back and forth between private and public delivery of lab services. Um, have we learned from that? Uh, and finally, where is this balance cost benefit analysis, not just in the provincial ledger books, but the cost benefit analysis for us as Albertans? What do we gain from this change? And what might we expect to lose um, from these changes? So the easy question to answer uh, from my perspective as a researcher was who benefits? Uh, and ab absolutely, the United Conservative Party as government benefited from this, this deal with Dynalife. Um, part of that is, is to provide the context because what was happening behind the scenes with laboratory services in Alberta prior to the spring election in, in 2019 was a move towards a province-wide, wholly publicly funded, publicly delivered, integrated lab services. So this is a change where Dynalife was delivering some of the lab services in Edmonton and a few Northern communities. There was um, a semi-autonomous lab service in Calgary that operated within um, AHS called Cal Calgary Lab Services. It was wholly public because it had previously been 50-50 public and private. The private partners pulled out and it had to be absorbed into AHS a number of years ago. Um, it was a very successful model was being used um, and studied by policy experts um, internationally and in other parts of Canada. And so the decision under the Notley government was to sort of scale up that model that Calgary Lab Services was using and make that province-wide and entirely um, publicly delivered. So that was the creation of what was called Alberta Public Labs. Um, so what happened when the UCP won the election in 2019 is what we call the uh, Parkland Institute, the summer of repeal, basically taking apart these big flagship projects that had been associated with the Notley government um, and dismantling them mostly because they could, uh, because they made for good narrative, they made for outrage politics, um, and they could be something that differentiated their government. The first thing that happened was the large um, public lab hub, which was being built here in Edmonton. So was going to be the sort of anchor for that new province-wide public lab services. Ground was already broken. Foundations were being poured on the site um, and work was, was shut down in the middle of construction uh, in the name of saving money. So um, as far as this narrative of who benefits goes, this was a political win for the UCP because they could sell it as, you know, stopping this wholly expensive, ideologically driven project of creating a lab service where we really didn't need, didn't need one. Um, part of this was because of an extensive network of lobbyists um, that were influencing the UCP behind the scenes and um, deputy ministers within the um, Department of Health, uh, Alberta Health itself. So a lot of these lobbyists we found in our research were former uh, Conservative Party staffers at the national or provincial level. Many of them had direct ties to Kenny um, and other key figures within the UCP. Um, and many of them had direct ties to organizations like Dynalife. Um, so uh, uh, one of the biggest lobbyists, pardon me, was uh, Jason Pincock, the CEO of Dynalife itself. Sorry, I hit my hit my scroll wheel. So Dynalife has, of course, a benefit from this. They get to um, make lots of money off of this contract. There was a lot of controversy because prior to the um, NDP's election, there was a proposal to contract out the lab services to an Australian company uh, called Sonic Labs. Dynalife were really unhappy about this. They had some justification for it because the proposal process was flawed. It was not done through proper channels or with proper procedures. But that's not why Dynalife was mad. Dynalife was mad because they were missing out on a $20 billion contract for the, this um, easy 
high volume, uh, low stakes um, testing contract. So clearly they benefit significantly from this. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of these claims and here's where I'm gonna call in on Mike a little bit as well to speak to a couple of these myths and claims that were being used to justify the privatization after this back and forth between the proposed Sonic deal under the progressive conservative government, moving to the planned provincial holy public system and now saying, no, no, wait, hold up. We've got to go back to, to an outsourced privatized delivery. Um, what was the reasoning behind that? The biggest justification that was given by the UCP was this uh, question of cost savings. The um, Ernest, Ernst and Young, I always want to <clears throat> say that wrong. Ernest, Ernest yeah. they're <laughs> so earnest. Um, Ernst and Young was commissioned to do a review of Alberta Health Services to find efficiencies, find some nickels hidden in the sofa cushions. Um, and as usual with these things, the best way to save money from their perspective is to lay off staff and to cut corners and to outsource as much as possible. Uh, and that was the upshot of the review. Um, Parkland Institute did a, a critical analysis of that review. You can find it on our website if you want to know more about their plan for the overall um, health service there. But they valued this um, outsourcing of lab services at up to a hundred million dollars uh, in savings. Um, and that number was used extensively in the, the PR for the UCP government to justify this about face on lab services. Now, there wasn't an actual um, cost benefit analysis that was made or, or like a business case that was made public. Uh, we requested one. We were told it didn't exist. Um, some guy called Drew Barnes down in uh, Medicine Hat claimed that he had seen one, but he didn't want to share it with us. Um, so we don't know, did somebody crunch the numbers on this? But the difficulty was in the um, emails that we received through FOIP between uh, staff at Ernst & Young, staff within AHS, and staff at APL, the labs division, was that these numbers didn't add up within Alberta Health Services' own calculations. So after all was said and done, they redid the math and found that completely outsourcing the community lab services would save maximum 18 to $36 million. It's hugely different from 102. And well, Rebecca, that that's Rebecca, tell us again, how much are they potentially gonna make off of this contract? up to 20 billion. That's not public. That's how much the Sonic contract was worth. Right. And that was only covering Edmonton and Northern Alberta. So now Dynalife has been awarded uh, community lab services delivery for all of Alberta and some additional test processing services. So we don't know if that's 20 billion or if that's 50 billion, it could be anything. Um, that's um, a restricted piece of information under the FOIP Act. So uh, they don't have to disclose that. But it could save us millions, but it probably isn't. We'll put it that way. Um, when we talk about that 18 to $36 million figure, which is what AHS revised that down, um, any of that savings, that comes from workers. And like to be really clear about that, the cost of processing the tests or collecting blood samples, preparing slides, that part doesn't change. What what can where the savings can be found is through automation, through laying off staff, or through hiring less skilled, uh, less senior staff. So, Mike can speak to that. Yeah, a little no, bit. I I, did, I don't want to step on you. I love listening to you talk, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Okay, um, but, but come but back in. <laughs> you you nailed you nailed it when you when you highlighted it. The test tubes still cost the same. Uh, we have uh, equipment within AHS that didn't keep getting fixed. And if you've ever owned a car, you have to keep changing the oil once in a while to keep a car running. Well, when they 
started talking about this privatization, they said, oh, it's going to cost so much money to get these machines replaced. We're going to have to outsource this work. Well, they saved all this money by not doing any of that. Transition these workers out. The hourly rate is less. The retirement security is minimal compared to what having an actual pension plan looked like. Folks, let's be clear. These are the people that were on the front lines of healthcare during COVID that saved our bacon. And without a stroke of a pen, and they are gone to a lesser quality of life for the exact same critical work that they do every single day. I'm not sure how deep you want me to go, Rebecca. I don't want to talk over. I'm saving my notes here for a few minutes from now. We'll come back on to some of those points. Karen's got a comment. Sorry. Sure. She's muted, though. Sorry, question in the question and answer function. And just a reminder for folks to put their questions there. Um, but that number amount, uh, 20 billion, is staggering. And um, the question is 20 billion over how many years? Mm. Um, what I have, and I don't know if Rebecca's got some FOIP doc there, but yeah. there's a 10 year plus a 10 year extension. So this is a 20 yeah. year, uh, we're tied with this company for 20 years. And yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that what you have, so Rebecca? You, you have similar numbers? Sonic, um, I think for Sonic, that 20 billion was a 10 year initial contract. And again, it's similar to what was laid out for DynaLife in terms of the, it's a 10 year initial period. And then they have the option for a 10 year renewal. So we can assume that whatever that amount is, if it's 20 billion for DynaLife or, or more, you, they got to keep up with inflation, folks. Um, that it would be around over that that 10 year period initially. Sorry to, yes, it does make a difference. It's not a lump sum payment. Um, well, okay, so it's not 20 billion a year. The question no. is, is it spread over those 10 years? So 2 billion per year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank but again, you. we don't have access because all of this was negotiated behind closed doors. What Rebecca is referencing and Rebecca, please, uh, yeah. is the information we were able to get from the Sonic, or she was able to get from the Sonic contracts, and and, but er, all of these decisions were made behind closed doors for DynaLife and their shareholders. Yeah. So the exact number hasn't been released for this current contract that has gone through. The number I'm referencing, that 20 billion over 10 years, was negotiated in uh, 2014 um, between the PC government and and Australian Sonic Corp. So um, some of the, the difficulties with this, if we take apart the, the question of cost savings, okay, there's already some significant holes um, and contestation over those numbers. How much is this really saving us? Um, the cost of just canceling the, the build on the new lab in Edmonton and remediating the giant hole in the ground was upwards of 30 million. Again, we weren't given um, an exact figure on cancellation penalties that the government paid for that, only the cost of, um, of um, the work that had already been done and filling the hole. So the cost savings question is, is, is now um, questionable. The second claim was made, it was around efficiency. Well, this is far more efficient. We can just outsource it. It's not our problem anymore. Right, DynaLife's been doing this work in Edmonton, so they're experts at it. And that part of that is true that the workers within DynaLife they're good at doing their job, um, and that's no shade on them. But the question of efficiency is a really difficult one, um, particularly within healthcare or other forms of social care. One, because of what's happening here is there's um, a fragmentation within the lab system. So now we've got some things that are going to be done by DynaLife and other things that are still being done by APL. But there's a huge amount of overlap between those processes. They don't have the same um, sort of standard operating procedures. They don't have the same quality standards. They don't, for a long time, they weren't even operating the same couriers to, to, to transport um, samples between collection sites and processing sites. So all of that stuff has to be standardized and brought together in a way um, that somehow you know ensures that there's no gaps between the DynaLife system over here and the APL system over there. 
Um, I'm hearing from some lab workers that, that that's already causing some difficulty. And I'll provide an example of that in a minute. So it also is because there, now there's two service providers. There's gaps between those services, but potentially there's also duplication. So there's spaces where you have two systems that are having to, to do the same work. Um, you have to have two payroll uh, processes, for example, two HR, two, you, you know, all of those support systems for those organizations have to be in place. So you're duplicating that. Um, and finally, the, the efficiency, I guess the question of when you had a plan that was set in motion, where all of these pieces were being put together to creating APL, building the hub lab, um, workers were already being informed about how their roles might change within the new APL organization and what that would mean. They'd already printed business cards and stationery. Um, and just a, a very seemingly simple example, the minute the Kenny government came in um, in 2019, they changed the name of APL from Alberta Public Labs to Alberta Precision Labs. There was no justification given to workers uh, about this. There was no warning given even to APL executive. This came down on a random Tuesday. Um, and one of the comments that was made in a kind of like a, a employee chat uh, conversation, was like, I just ordered stationery. What am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with letter? Says Alberta Public Labs. They had to change their email addresses. And you think this is small change, but for a huge organization with thousands of employees, there, there's no efficiency in, in flipping that. Um, and we'll put it that way. And finally, when we're talking about healthcare services, efficiency is not your byword when you're providing care and making life or death decisions quality of care, redundancy of processes, double checking, accuracy. Those are your priorities when you're, you're trying to determine a medical diagnosis or confirm a diagnosis for patients. Efficiency often prioritizes speed and quantity. Uh, and that's not always going to help the best interests of patients. Mike. Mike. That's fantastic. Thanks, Rebecca. I, uh, I'm i sitting here listening and, I, and I'm, I'm going in my mind through the history of this as you're describing. I live near the uh, once famous uh, modern lab that was that was called everything from uh, over, you know, whatever, the white elephant, the overpriced, all this stuff. It was just a modern lab is all we were talking about there. Yeah. So uh, I first want to give a shout out to Yvonne. I know Yvonne's out there listening. She's texting me and I just want to say hi to her. She's an advocate for strong public health care. I just want to say that. And the foreshadow that you alluded to, Rebecca, on the change of APL's name. I'm going to come back to that in a second here. But, uh, you know, when you when you look at the impact here, we've got to recognize that the people are doing the work. Uh, are not the ones who are talking about. This is the corporate profit margins that we're going to talk about. I'm going to get into a couple of letters that I have received from the new owners of DynaLife and their response to me uh, on their pensions in a moment. But it's this ideology of, of taking this, this profiteer model, or this efficiency, as Rebecca's talked about, and it, it just doesn't exist. We saw it under the sonic piece. We've gone through that bit. Within the DynaLife system, I am hearing just this week firsthand from the workers that this work, this unit of work has come over to APL and a unit of workers have come into APL. They don't match. There is way more work now. And we saw it most recently in Calgary, I believe it was just 10 days ago, where there's lineups down the street. People cannot get in to have their lab work done. There's a structural change in smaller Alberta sites where it says, you must now show up with an appointment pre-scheduled online because you can't just do walk-in anymore. So these are some of the service changes that are just uh, gently making it more and more difficult as, as this transition becomes more efficient. To do, do some other background, there are now RFPs out for home care, for long-term care, interfacility transfers is now has an open RFP. Surgical charters are, are popping up now, Calgary and Edmonton, requests for more in uh, other parts of the province. I'm gonna go back in history. There's a battle unfolding between the Canby 
surgical center in British Columbia that I'm sure we're going to see going to the Supreme Court someday for the ability of these private for-profits to charge additional rates to ensure that you pay even more um, for, for best of service or something like that. In a recent conversation with members on the front lines, they are now employer that's out there. And so some of these pieces, and, and as Rebecca went through a report, there needs to be a profit margin because in, in, a, in a publicly funded, publicly delivered model, any spare savings at the end accountability to the shareholders. What I'm going to read to you is a letter response to me from the owner owner of Dynalife. So Dynalife is owned by another company. And I'm going to read one piece of it that says, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the members that we serve. To fulfill our commitment to them, our strategy is to invest in diversified, well-run assets across the globe that enable us to deliver consistent, long-term investment returns to pay. Our investment in Dynalife, which is a partial ownership, they had to clarify that, uh, positions through our strong infrastructure business is consistent with this strategy. Folks, I am not talking about healthcare when I make this statement. This is a for-profit. And the hardest part for me to say in this moment with you on the line is that this company that I'm talking about is the Ontario Pension Plan. The Public Sector Pension Plan of Ontario, or OMERS, is an over 50% sharehold owner of Dynalife. And when these workers are bringing, coming out of APL into Dynalife, they have been denied their wages and they're being denied their benefit package, specifically their pension, by a pension company for public sector workers in Ontario. That's how messed up all of this is. And if you're ever confused about where every nickel will go, that they can save on folks lining up to get their tests done or the, the backs of the workers in all of this, it comes down to this. Shareholders need to make profits. That's why they're in the business of owning healthcare assets. I'm not sure, Karen, how deep in we want to go with, with this. I know that you've got some questions bubbling up. Why don't we sure. step into that a little bit? Sure, I wanted to ask, do you want to finish uh, your presentation, Rebecca, or do you want me to ask the questions as we go along? Um, a time check, I know it's a, like a very emotional topic for everybody, but we have about 23 minutes left. Yeah, I think um, I've deliberately put more in rather than less so okay. that, um, you know, just so that we can adapt as needed to to what everybody wants to hear. So I think those are kind of the, a lot of the, the big um, themes that we wanted to cover. If we go into questions, I can pull up some of my other um, slides if, if that's relevant to it, so. Sure, maybe we could um, stop the screen share then and have you folks, um, yeah, that's better. Okay, so uh, there was a question that said, uh, what is the net loss of staff that went from AHS labs to Dynalife? And did previous public employees lose their jobs? I guess that's for you, Mike. Yeah, net loss of staff. I, uh, loss, there was no loss. The number of people, the workers who were moved from APL into Dynalife at the moment sits roughly around 1,000. There is going to be two blocks of work that move over. And the, there's a second staging of work that will be coming over to be determined workers that will be moving as well to be determined. So we don't have clear numbers yet. And this is a, when you, when you negotiate a contract behind closed doors, we don't see the money. We don't understand the impact on the people until it's dropped down on us. And that's why we're still fighting at the labor board 
uh, right now on this issue. This is a very live issue for HSAA on this transition. Go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah, and just to add to that, so the language of the um, of the contract, or per the, the RFP anyway, says that workers will be moved over from APL to Dynalife to similar roles um, under similar collective agreements. So yeah. while HSCA, for example, oversees the collective agreements, the bargaining units for both Dynalife and APL, their, their um, agreements are not the same. Uh, as Mike alluded to, there's some, some very big differences there. What was a big concern when we surveyed um, lab workers as part of our research, a very big concern for those who had a lot of experience in lab was that that, that wiggle room in similar roles. Yep. Um, you alluded in your introduction, Karen, to the cuts under Klein. Um, the lab sector was one of the biggest uh, victims of those cuts. While healthcare was, was hit with 20%, lab itself faced almost a 40% budget cut. So there were massive changes there. Um, and what happened was this language of moving into similar roles meant that people were actually being put into positions where their job description changed, they were given more responsibility but less seniority, they were being told, oh, you can't have your, your APL job or you can't have your public job in Edmonton, but we might have a similar job for you in Drayton Valley. And that's similar. You know, so on paper, they're saying there's no loss um, of jobs for, for these lab workers, but there's a huge sense of uncertainty and precarity about whether they're going to move into um, a job that is, that is th the same for them or whether it's even doable for them to move, the kind of level of, of people moving their lives around. So I think that's um, something that gets lost when you're reading just the, the letter of the agreement. If I could add one more piece, and, and Rebecca chimed right in on what it looks like. In Morinville, it was just last year, as all of this was bubbling around and unfolding, uh, a notice comes out to all the, the members working at the collection site in Morinville and said, we're closing down this shop and you have, I believe it was like a 21 day notice or whatever it was, you need to either be going 35 kilometers to the next town, maybe there's a job, maybe into the Edmonton area, maybe, or you're out of work. And then 48 hours later, oops, that was a mistake. Like it was, it has been an absolute uh, bubbling chaos for the workers who are involved in this. And the, it's difficult because we don't have the answers. They won't give us the answers and it gets dripped out and, and foiped by Rebecca and team is eventually how we get these answers from these people. So Mike, um, a question uh, partly that pertains to the Q&A function, but also um, just something in general. These, um, we all know that there's um, empty lines everywhere and there's not enough people to do the jobs that are currently um, out there and we have a human uh, resource uh, crisis. And yeah. I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are about the effects of privatization on the ability to re recruit and retain, number one. And then something along the similar lines is about benefits for people. Um, the question then in the Q&A is that, is it correct that private company employees cannot under plan rules for the LAPP pension plan belong to the plan? Wow. There's a, there's a whole bunch of questions in this yes. one that we're going to walk through. And uh, <laughs> And Rebecca, you now your turn. Jump in any time on this. I'll give you a couple of opinions and a couple of pieces that I can talk about. The health human resource uh, issue uh, requires the work, I believe, of a national strategy because right now we are robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Currently, it's a better working life in maybe Ontario or BC, so our folks move. Tomorrow, Saskatchewan's better, and they move again. This robbing across the country is doing no favors to the healthcare industry. You want to talk about mitigating costs and all of that? Stabilize our workforce through a national strategy, and maybe we can talk further. That's just an opinion piece I'll throw out there. I look for any comments from Rebecca on that one. But I have heard things like, oh, you're creating competition. Competition drives down the price. We're not talking about pork bellies here, folks. This isn't about uh, how many eggs are in the market today. There is one pool of workforce in healthcare. And 
in HSAA, we have 240 distinct disciplines. Some of them have only maybe 40 or 50 workers in the entire province. They are that specialized. In the health human resource, looking at lab, there are not enough workers. And I heard you say the empty lines, and that's exactly where I'm going here. There are unfilled shifts all across this province, and we don't have the people to fill them. So by opening up, call it competition, or this, this second stream that is not as robust, that doesn't treat its workers equally to the other site, there's going to continue to be this back and forth. Because if I move into site A and there is two bucks more at site B, I'm going to try and get there. That's just the natural shift. It doesn't enhance the cost of healthcare by competition. That's not how it works. It increases the cost through recruiting, through training, through all the pieces that are needed to bring new workers online. The question of pension, uh, real quick. Um, in the LAPP, there is a plan design that talks about who can be in and who can be out. That plan design has changed over the last 24 months that allows for the board to consider any application. And this board that sits as, as LAPP has considered some recently that are not public sector local authorities, but are not for profit, are non profit, and could potentially be for profit industries. An example Capital Power is part of LAPP. They have shareholders. If, if Dyna Life wanted to do the right thing, they could make application to LAPP for, on behalf of the workers that they now uh, have working for them. Rebecca, anything from you on that topic? Yeah. Um, so in terms of that, that big question about there's one pool of workers, and you pointed to this with your example um, from Ontario, the um, samples and slides that are being sent here to Alberta for testing, because those backlogs that are happening in test processing in Ontario, because of staff shortages at Dynacare, which is the sister company to Dynalife. So they're already facing those same pressures due to the pandemic, due to um, cutting costs and, and all of those other factors, and are trying to square their circle by, by outsourcing that work to Alberta. What happens when very, very, very quickly here, Alberta can't absorb that, whether through, through the Dynalife side or where it comes onto APL being asked to pick that up either, they're already stretched. So that's the question you say that you can't just keep passing the hot potato um, and, and saying that this is somehow improving the service um, in the broad sense, it definitely isn't. Mm -hmm. So um, the second piece to that, I think, is that the entire um, atmosphere is one not only of uncertainty for workers, but also a, a deep feeling of like being jerked around, uh, particularly in Alberta, because of this 180 flip-flop that's been happening for lab. Um, the sense that they're not being informed the sense that they don't know is their department going to be transitioning next and what's going to happen there. So that political tension, I mean that broadly, you know, not in a party sense, but that that lab is is now a political football for people that doesn't attract people into the sector at all. It makes it a no go. Um, and the final piece to that is that you get someone like Jason Pincock, the CEO of Dynalife, think, well, we'll just, we'll just train more lab uh -huh. professionals. We're gonna, we're gonna double the number of training spaces at Nate in the next eight months. Uh, interesting, who just got appointed to the board of directors for Nate? For Nate. Yeah. Jason Pincock, CEO of Dynalife and talking to some of the instructors in the lab program there, they don't have the capacity to just simply double those spaces overnight. So again, it's this, this question that um, this isn't an assembly line. You can't just plug people in where you want them. 
Um, and you certainly can't do it when they feel as a sector that their um, piece is in a political war. And Rebecca, when you talk about uh, the Nate piece and, and doubling the production of, of students coming out, what we see time and again is this deconstruction of the work that's being done into its smaller its tailored portions or however you want to describe it that's best for the audience here. But they break it down to the most simplistic pieces. And now you're hiring. Uh, I mean, I think it was Pincock that I, I heard recently that said he could go to the stadium and hire hot dog salespeople and train them up. I believe that's how he was framing that conversation. And I'll be honest, no disrespect to the hot dog salespeople. You can't just do this stuff. It doesn't work that way. But this is the concept we're trying on breaking down work into its simplest components, which means you don't even have to have a, a, a medical background, a formal understanding of what you're doing anymore. That's the risk in all of this. Yeah, thanks um, both of you for your responses to that. Um, there's another interesting uh, comment in the Q&A saying, and I think this applies not just to lab, I think this applies to actually the private surgical clinics as well, but it says, did I understand, um, did I understand that these are all high volume types of tests? In other words, the lab is skinning the easiest work. Yeah, I can yes. take a little bit of that. Oh, sorry. You, I, I buzzed in first on this one. <laughs> it's just, uh, you're just going to get a straight yes from me. But my yeah. what, you're, what you're talking about here is the volume versus the complex and absolutely right. So when you're doing hips, knees and cataracts, uh, there's now a, a new one. It's for, um, mm, it's another consulting piece that you can go through or you turn it right into the lab system. Let's, let's stay on surgery for a second and see how we can bring it right across to, to lab. Doing hips, knees, and cataracts can be the high volume in and outs, and we can reduce the wait times on these key indicators. Why are they key indicators? Because somebody chose to use them as key indicators because they're going to make a difference in a second here. What they don't do key indicators on is how many heart transplants can we possibly do per hour or other complex surgeries that require highly specialized. And so what they do is this. Well, look at the lab. They were able to do 2,000 tests per minute at a cost of eight cents per test. And look at the AHS, all oh, this bulky, uh, inefficient work, public sector. And they're doing a test that cost $18 to do. And this is how they argue this. So you hived off all that little uh, less complex hips, knees, or fast volume testing that you can automate and you left all of the more complex stuff behind. So that hip and knee gets out on a Friday afternoon and goes home, and Saturday morning they've got an infection. Where are they going? Right into public sector that has now been decimated because all the surgeons work only in the for-profit facilities. This is the fruit. Rebecca. Yeah, I was just going to say here, I have a, a quote here from one of our our um, interviewees for our report, which really speaks to that and this sense that now you are making testing decisions based on accounting rationale, not based on medical and, and scientific decision making. Um, and I think that's that's um, a completely skewed approach to bring to to any kind of um, public service, but particularly healthcare. The second thing that I'm hearing from, um, from lab workers, um, one who is working in um, a highly complex transplant unit uh, at one of our major hospitals here in Alberta, and they're saying as part of APL, their ability to do complex specialized testing is now being restricted by what DynaLife will process. So for example, they used to do five preparations of slides for a particular um, type of, of testing for transplant recipients. And they still have to prepare those slides and specimens at her hospital. But now when they send them to DynaLife for processing, they're not allowed to process them in-house anymore. DynaLife says, oh, we only process the first two because that's more efficient and it's higher volume. There's only a few people that really need those other ones. It's kind of specialized. So, you know, in this name of efficiency, it's literally saying that um, those one in a million patients 
their diagnosis doesn't matter. It can be delayed. It's not statistically significant. Um, and that's really, really problematic. Yeah, that's actually very scary um, when you're relying on that for clinical decisions. I'm going to ask um, three questions because we're almost out of time now. Um, but one is, without getting into um, a whole lot of details, uh, can Alberta afford to continue to um, invest in its public services, number one? Um, and the next question, um, well, it's, it's actually more of a comment. How do these practices of just-in-time delivery impact workers and services in healthcare? And uh, as a call to action, what can um, APL employees and the public in general actually do? The UCP doesn't care that workers are unhappy because ultimately they have no control over the decision making. Yeah. So you don't have to answer all three, but maybe one of you could take one and the other could take two. Sure. Um, I think that maybe Rebecca, maybe I'll ask you this question uh, and you might have some data on this. Can we afford to invest was the question asked by Karen, but in my mind, my response is, how can we afford not to? When you, when you look at this system, when you look at our, when you look at how much money is going into the DynaLife pocket and then off to shareholders in Ontario and understand that those were the dollars we were supposed to be using to ensure that all five of those tests were done, Need them, not empty lines. The just in time work is an interesting one. I would argue that a lot of the workforce is being treated as just in time workforce now, and they only bring on extra staff when they feel they have no other choice and hope that these workers are sitting in the wings waiting for a phone call. That's not really the question. I appreciate that, but that's where my mind goes on that one. Maybe Rebecca, you, you got you want to join me here? So I think absolutely you're right. Can we afford not to? Um, and, and that requires a fundamental like shift, like I said, in terms of providing um, a public service like healthcare or education. Your return on investment, if you need to put it in those terms, that comes generations from now. That comes from a healthy, happy, learned, skilled population. But the costs to not doing that get dispersed. They get spread throughout society. You get more pressures on your ER. You get more pressure on um, your social services. You get all of the, you know, if you miss a diagnosis with lab, that person's going to show up in emergency or that person's going to go back to their GP again and again and again, trying to figure out what's, why am I not getting this? Uh, an example from Ireland that cost them um, dearly in financially and, and um, morally was a series of mistakes in their um, cervical pap smear testing. Mm. They outsourced yeah. it. Yeah. There were delays. There were mistakes in which diagnoses of cervical cancer were not caught in many dozens of women, many of whom died before um, the mistake in the system could be rectified. So on a purely financial basis, the Irish state had to pay out hundreds of millions of euros in compensation to those families. They had to bring those services back in house and rebuild their service from scratch. And they can't ever fix the lives that were lost from those mistakes. So when we're talking about affordability, the question can't just be as simple as, as can we cash this check? But if we want to ask that, we got a budget surplus right now, and we've got plenty of money for um, DynaLife to receive research and innovation grants, you know, that could very easily be going into a new centrifuge for, uh, for my friend, the lab worker. Absolutely. Rebecca, how about you and IT off on this final? We got like, I think we're down to the seconds here. So let me say this. The call to action was the last piece that Karen threw our way. I want to cite this. There is now the next steps of privatization heading into home care, long-term care, inter-facility transfer. My friends, what I'm trying to say is this, 
what we have seen and are seeing live on the work that was APL, and it's not precision in my mind, it was public and it always should have been, is now shifting, or is gonna land on these next sections. You want me to give you a call to action, I'm gonna call you this. It's time to have those difficult discussions with your friends, neighbors, and family. Get rid of a government that holds the ideology of privatization as a pinnacle, and get a government that holds public sector funds publicly delivered by health, Alberta workers that's the way out of this. This must end. We must get rid of the people who are making these decisions. Rebecca, last words to you, my friend. Absolutely, because this doesn't just affect workers and it doesn't just affect some faceless you know, name on a testing tube. Th these are going to be your neighbors and your friends who are seeking medical diagnoses in terms of lab. It's going to be your kids or your grandkids who are suddenly finding that, oh, their, their education services are being contracted out. There's a new voucher system coming in for K to 12. I wonder who's profiting off of that. Or when you're needing to call an ambulance, this affects every single one of us as Albertan. And the only thing I wanna say is, and I'm, I won't make friends with this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There is an election coming up this spring and that is absolutely crucial to changing these things, but it only happens if we put the same amount of accountability on whoever comes into government, because these things have to not just be halted, they have to be reversed. We have to stop saying, well, these bad decisions were already made and we're gonna live with them and try to muddle through. We have to create those better much Rebecca and Mike um there was a question about where uh, folks could find your report Rebecca um and do you just want to give a quick shout out to where that and many other great reports could be found sure parklandinstitute.ca and uh, there's a whole section on reports every every piece of research that we do is available to download free and um if you like to learn more about the work that we're doing you can email me or call our offices at the university and yeah. Well, and I remember that Parkland is funded by donations from people just like you. So join up, subscribe, and support the Parkland Institute. How's that? And people That's like right. you, Mike Parker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to give a shout out to um, the AFL team, specifically MC and Beth, for helping um, pull this off. I really appreciate that. Thanks for spending your time. And I'll just do a shout out for our next Lunch and Learn is on February 28th, and it's about expanding educational opportunities. So thanks, everybody. Have a good day, um, and, and uh, have, a, have a good rest of the day.